Hello, my name is Kurt Schwer, and in this video I'd like to show you the technical details that went into a project called the Right Whale AIS project, or RAP, that I've been working on since uh, the year of 2006 when we first started taking a look at how we might be able to send messages out to ships in a more convenient way to help protect marine mammals. And the end product of, of this talk is getting towards creating something called the Whale Alert iPad and iPhone application. So we'll be building up and explaining all of the technical details that, that lead up to this. Now before I get going, I'd like to, to mention that there are many, many people who helped contribute to this, and I'll be showing figures from many of these folks. And there's so many people that it's just not possible to mention them by name. So here are quite a few of the organizations I might have missed, one or two. I most certainly probably did. And I'd like to call out uh, Noah Stellwagen Bank, uh, National Marine Sanctuary, for leading the project, and Cornell BRP, who maintains and runs all of the buoys and the, does the acoustic work. EarthNC produced the application. Seacom, JHC at UNH uh, funded part of my work in this through a NOAA grant that they have. And Google is now currently paying my bills. So when we're looking at the ocean, there's ships moving all around, and these are big objects, they're hard to move, and there's typically a person sitting in a bridge that's often far away from the nose of the ship. So it's a pretty challenging environment, and oftentimes you have multiple ships coordinating together, as you see here, a tug that's helping uh, a ship get through the Portsmouth, New Hampshire harbor. And on the bridge, there's a lot going on. There's usually multiple consoles and displays, and you're trying to look out the windows and do watch keeping. And as you can see here in this shot, the person who's actually operating the ship has got a lot going on and is never standing still. So what can we do to help make their lives operating a ship easier? Now they're always planning and working on charts, and this takes a lot of work. They spend a lot of time keeping aware of where they are, of where they're going, and how long it's going to be to get there. And when things go wrong, it's important to be able to see what's happening. So here, for example, is some trouble at sea with uh, natural gas, or LNG, which stands for liquefied natural gas, ship coming into the city of Boston, and they actually lost power to their engines. Now, thankfully, the winds were blowing away from shore, and the ship was drifting away. So not, not that big of a deal. <clears throat> they were able to get help and get things started up again. But, you know, when things go wrong, you want to have the best awareness of what's going on. And the unfortunate fact of the matter is that there are a lot of things that happen out on our oceans. It's just like on the roads. People try to be as safe as they can, but no matter what, things are going to happen. The, the key thing to remember is we're trying to take incidents, and in, otherwise known as accidents in the normal English vocabulary, uh, we're trying to reduce those to the minimum number that happen in an area. So this is... Uh, believe five years of Coast Guard data talking about where their investigations have been. Uh, do, don't mind the things in Greenland. There's lots of uh, location position problems in their, their database. So if you look at the Gulf of Mexico, there's just a lot going on. So what we want to do is to be able to find ways that we can reduce these numbers of incidents. And that's a big part of the CECOM JHC project known as Chart of the Future. So looking at ways that we can not just get more data onto the bridge of the ship, but we can get the right data and get it into a simplified form such that it's immediately obvious what's going on in your environment. And the, I mean, here's a great example of what happens when you lose situational awareness. Here is the Costco Busan that ran to the San Francisco Bay Bridge a few years ago. And it's a perfect example of uh, things not working, people not having their own equipment that they trust, and just a whole chain of things that broke down. Basically, it says that technology and people and the ship are not working well together. So one of the things that can really help this is um, something called AIS, or Automatic Identif Identification System. And what that is, is it's a small device. It's a transceiver put on a ship, and it broadcasts where the ship is at a variable rate. It, it broadcasts faster if you're moving faster, if you're turning a lot. And it lets everybody around you know what's going on. So here's an engineer at Seacom. This is Andy McLeod on top of a ship installing the antennas. And it lets everybody else know where you are, and then you can hear where everybody else is all automatically, and it goes right into the display on the front of your ship. 
That way there's a lot less uh, hassle with when you call someone on the radio and you know who you're calling. You're not calling the ship you know, next to the point uh, who's going to be in your way and you have to get through there. You can actually call them by name. Much easier. So here's an example of what some of the devices that are actually running AIS look like. This is sitting on my desk in my office. It's everything from the big, call, uh, quote, Class A, which devices that are meant to go on the bridge of a ship. The, there's one on the top left and on the right. Those are Class A devices, meaning they're meant for the big big ships. And then for the smaller boats, uh, you, you can, at your option, install something called a Class B transceiver. And the two white guys in the Nauticast and the one on the bottom in the middle, those are all the um, Class Bs. And the bottom left are two little uh, receive only units that we use in stations for listening on shore who's around. So that gives you a sense of some of the technology. This stuff, it, you can fit it in your hand. It's a little expensive. It's 500 to a couple thousand dollars depending on the unit you're buying. And onshore, we have these receive stations that then keep track of what's going on. Uh, these are two stations that are installed in the Boston area. The one on the right is actually in the basement of Cape Cod, and you can see a person in the top right up on the roof who's working on the antenna that goes with it. So if you're ever in the Cape Cod Visitor Center, think about what's going on underneath your feet, that uh, there's actually stuff in the basement that's helping out with mariners get around and be safe. And when you have this kind of data, you can start thinking about what kind of tool can you put together to help people think about navigating around. So this is a, a figure from actually a robot designed to go to Mars back from the late 90s. And what it's doing is it's looking at its environment and predicting what's safe and what's not. And this is some of the inspiration for the idea of how do we uh, look at the world with a computer and present something to a person that tells them what's good or bad about your world. Uh, if, for example, these red zones are areas you really don't want to go. Yellow is a little bit more hazardous. The weird thing about this one is, of course, it knows a lot more right about the vehicle, so it gets nervous about stuff it really knows about. But the idea is that we want to be able to present something that lets somebody else make a judgment, and it, it helps them out. It's really obvious, and it's quick to look at. So here's the overall view for this kind of thing. So here's uh, this is actually water level, so you need to know how much water is underneath your ship, and if you don't have enough, you run aground. So we've worked on ways to try and figure out how to broadcast tide stations right to the ship and then be able to present a chart that changes based on water level. And AIS is one way that you might be able to transmit this to ships. So as they're driving in, they can figure out which part of the tide cycle they're going to make it in. And if as they're going through, they suddenly realize that things aren't going to be good enough for some reason, maybe winds coming up and pushing water across the harbor, they can call it off quick and keep the ship safe. Now with AIS, the, the key thing is why do we care about whales? And the oceans are busy, there's a ton of ships. On the left you'll see some data from SpaceQuest and it shows just uh, position reports for a day from their satellite. Um, there's a ton of ships out there and the vessel observation system, it's basically a voluntary observation system, is ships reporting weather from their uh, instruments. Uh, they do this voluntarily and they help out everybody around them. And you can just see that there are tons of ship tracks around and that's just a small fraction of the ships who are driving around on the oceans. Now sharing that same space are whales and many other species and some of these species are endangered or near extinct. For example the North Atlantic right whale there's three or four hundred uh, individuals left and every time a ship hits one of them that's a tragedy and pushing them closer towards extinction. If we can reduce that number, we still have a chance of saving the species. The one trouble is, is that as things get more and more busy out there, that means that there's more and more pressure on the whales. So what can we do to allow commerce to keep going forward, economies to grow, and actually make it safer for whales at the same time? Now, as you're working with AIS, here's a sense of what we kind of see with the data. You can see all kinds of interesting things. For example, this is a couple of ships out building a pipeline in the ocean. So they're working really hard in an area and they're having some impact on the environment and they're building infrastructure for us as a country. So this kind of stuff gives you a sense of what's going on in the water and helps you start to plan about how are you going to manage this on the environment and long term for our overall economy. And we can start taking that data 
and we can do things like pattern analysis. We can break out what kinds of ships are going through our waters. We can figure out where they're going and why. So here's Norfolk Harbor, Virginia. And we went and applied some statistical methods to look at where they start and stopped. So when do people pause and why are they hanging out in particular parts of our waterways? We applied some statistical things and came up with some really nice patterns that match parts of our uh, infrastructure in Norfolk. For example, there's an anchorage up in the top center circle, and that is an area that's actually designated for ships to stop. There's actually ships that do stop elsewhere, but for this case, they're actually using an anchorage well. Um, they're using certain cargo terminals a lot more than others, and the traffic's really split up. So once you start understanding how and why ships are moving about the area, you can start to figure out what do you need to do to make the waterway safer for everybody, both ships running into static objects, which is an elision, uh, ships running into another ship, which is a collision, or a ship strike where a ship hits like a marine mammal or something like that. So here's looking at Boston, we can see that there's uh, different traffic patterns for different types of ships. If you look in the top right, you'll see tugs tend to go north, south through the sanctuary. They're trying to skirt along the coast, whereas tankers and cargo ships, passenger ships, will typically come in and out of the the TSS, or Traffic Separation Scheme, those are the, the highways of the ocean. And you'll see two of those across the bottom, heading from bottom right to a little bit in the middle on the left, heading straight for downtown Boston. Now that tells us that we have an area of really high density ship traffic. Uh, please ignore the research ships, they tend to be following whales and doing strange things like that, so they kind of go every which way. So we now have a pattern of understanding of, of where ships really go in this area, and we can start looking at who is in that neighborhood. So if we look at tankers, we have some really strong patterns about where they're at, and this, this is the Stalwagen Bank Marine Sanctuary, shown in the white lines. And in that area, we can start doing things like looking at how much sound comes from these ships and how that might impact the whale population in the area. Now as we look at this, we find some interesting numbers, and in that we looked at the speed of the ships in this area, and we came up with some, some interesting points. There's a lot of ships in these sort of 15 knots region, and there's also a lot of ships hanging out just about 5 or 6 knots slower than that. And then there's a really weird outlier at the right on the ferries, where the top speed is actually over 40 knots. That's pretty fast. and now, while I first thought that was a bug in my software, it's actually not. It's the cat ferry going really, really fast. So this ferry comes in and it's just screaming through the water. And that presents us with a problem where if it hits anything going that fast, the consequences are really bad. It turns out if a whale is hit faster than about 10 knots, the chances of them suffering a life-threatening injury are very high. If you get below that speed, uh, they have a good chance of surviving any uh, incident where they bump into uh, a human form of transport. Now if you come through in the cat and you're going 40 knots and you hit a whale, I have a feeling that whale is long gone. That's just going to be the end of them. And the trouble with right whales is that these whales like to hang around the surface. They're kind of hard to see, they're slow moving, and they don't really react much to ships. Now looking at the statistics over the last uh, sort of two decades, this is um, some of the ship strikes that have happened, and there's a big cluster right around the Massachusetts uh, Cape Cod area. So we have a problem in that a lot of right whales are getting hit up in this area. Now the first thing that we have to do is we have to understand where are the right whales. So here's a NOAA website that I helped with that shows uh, the database that they've been getting from primarily observations from aircraft where they fly as much as they can, they look out the window, and these uh, hard-working folks have to keep their eyeballs peeled for hours at an end and write down every single whale they see out there that's a right whale. And that gives you a sense of where whales are, and from that you can start sending out alerts. So here's uh, an actual alert that went out in 2005, and these are typically faxed around, but that takes time to go from the aircraft, the observation, to returning to ground, to filling out the forms, to sending it around, to making a fax, to getting the fax out, and then it ends up on a ship, and then someone has to look at it. And they might not actually get the fax, so that would be a problem, and they might not know what's going on. 
So we have a big problem with these whales. It's hard to know where they are, and that can be fairly frustrating. So one of the things that a group of folks came up with, led by Chris Clark at Cornell and Dave Wiley at NOAA, was to create buoys in this area that would listen for the whale calls and then track where they were so that people might know that there was a more a greater likelihood of whales being in a particular area. And if you see here, take a look at this natural gas ship coming into Boston, the Burge Boston, and as she comes through the area, she's got to keep an eye out for other ships, uh, figure, make sure she's in the lane lines, keep a plan about when they're going to get to the harbor, how much uh, money they're going to make or lose from selling their natural gas, when are they going to leave and get back to the, get the next load, when are they going to get to get a vacation and get a break from working so hard. And yet there's yet another problem. Hopefully you can spot it in the picture. And you'll see right down here in this red circle, a tail from a whale. Now these folks on the bridge have got to somehow spot that. They need to know that there's likely to be whales out there. And if they assume that they're going to be looking for whales all the time and they're always going to be there, they're going to get fatigued. So you need to keep them thinking about what's going on. So that's a big problem. Now on some ships, this is the Langseth. It's a seismic vessel that does research. It actually has a whole section of the ship dedicated to watch standards. And this ship makes a lot of noise and has the potential to impact whales pretty greatly. So they've gotten very serious about posting watch standards and they bring in people whose sole job is to to look for whales. The trouble with these whales is they spend a lot of time underwater out of sight, which makes it extra difficult to spot them. You might be staring right at the spot and they could be just below the water where you can't see them. So what we've done uh, in the Stowagon Bank area is as a country, the folks who manage the area got together and figured out where the whales like to hang out and they realized that the traffic lanes went through an area of high density of right whales. Just year round, the chances are greater that the whales will be right in the middle of the traffic lanes rather than just a little bit north. This probably has a lot to do with where they can feed on the bottom, you know, the type of geology and sediments that are down there, the kind of fish that like to hang on that area, and the whales then snack on. So what they did is they moved the traffic lanes, basically like ripping up your highway and moving it over, to be out of the way of where the whales like to hang out. They're still a good chance of whales being out there, but it's a lot less than it would be if you drove around randomly outside of the traffic lanes. So that was done. It took a fair number amount of work from a lot of people, went all the way up to the International Maritime Organization and it is now International Rules. So it'll be on your charts. And with AIS, we can actually go in and look to see if the ships actually move. So here's a plot on the right that shows before and black and red after. And this is the month before and after the switch of the traffic lanes. And everybody but one ship went through on the new routes. And I bet that one ship, I haven't looked, it's probably right at midnight on the border. So he came through without really realizing what was going on, just at the edge of the time switch. So that's pretty impressive. Mariners are very aware of the rules, what's going on there. Their, their livelihood depends on it. If they don't follow the rules, they risk their license and it, their whole livelihood. So, and these folks really do care about the environment. So it's a combination of work from uh, all the managers and the, the mariners working together to decrease the risk of ships hitting whales. And here we have a great success, and it only added a little bit of extra time for ships coming into Boston to have to take a little bit of a turn and go a little farther north. So recently, the area has had the addition of two natural gas deep water terminals. Deep water being, you know, one or two hundred meters. It's not, in my world, deep is the deep ocean and four kilometers deep. But these are ports actually off the coast where a ship comes in and will hook up to a pipe underwater and add natural gas into our local pipelines and thereby providing our heating and energy needs for the area, uh, critical resources without having to go into the Boston Harbor with natural gas which tends to shut down the harbor and has all kinds of strict rules about dealing with it. So this is efficient for the local area and the boats then don't have to deal with the local harbor as much. As a part of this, there was an agreement that uh, they had to go ahead and build the terminal. They were going to have it to do a, an environmental offset. And a part of that, this is a very big terminal. And if you see here, you can see the pipeline design and the ship coming in and hooking up to this big yellow port that goes into the pipeline. 
uh, the pipelines up above. And as a part of this environmental offset, they came up with a way to help protect the whales. And below you can see the AIS ship track of them putting in one of these nodes. And there's two little red guys sitting up on top of one of these ports. They're pretty huge. And what this is is a bunch of buoys that sit between the, the incoming and outgoing traffic in the traffic lanes, or TSS. And these buoys listen for whales. And in fact, they record whale sounds out there, and they keep track of everything that's going on, and they run a little bit of automatic code developed by the Bioacoustics Research Program, or BRP, at Cornell. And these folks have created some automatic software that's pretty good at deciding whether or not a noise in the ocean is a right whale or something else. And so here's a plot of them working through a lot of data trying to figure out what's what in all of the calls. These little black lines you see around, some of them are noise, some of them are whales calling, and some of them are other things. So they've, they've used all this data to come up with some great algorithms to work on this. And from there, when a buoy out in the ocean hears a uh, noise that it thinks so might be a whale call, it calls up over an Iridium phone back to home, sends the data to Cornell, and a trained person, a very talented bioacoustician, will look at that spectrogram, these red things here, and listen to the whale sound. They've been through huge amounts of training, and they'll decide yes or no, is that a right whale call? And then they'll mark it in a database as, yep, we've heard it, and it goes into the system and can be used by a number of automatic programs to help get this data out to ships. So here's a close-up of one of the whale calls. It really takes an expert to know that this is a right whale call. You have to listen to it a few times and look at the spectrogram to know that right in there is a little whale call. Now with right whales, the key thing is that they like to call typically most in the evening in sort of the uh, evening hours and they'll call a lot more then. And so we have to be aware of the patterns of right whales in order to make decisions about how we're going to make these notices work. So here they've, they've gone out, listened to a ton of whales to make sure they know what the patterns are, and came up with this, they dominantly talk in the evening. So therefore, we pretty much have to keep an alert going for 24 hours because the whales are slow and they tend to call in the evening, so we want to keep the alert going for a day if we hear a whale in a particular zone. Now here's a display from Cornell of the web interface that they created. And the base, it shows the basics of what's going on. These are single listening devices that will hear a whale. And they don't tell you exactly where the whale is in the zone, but they know that the whale is typically within five nautical miles of the buoy when they hear it. That's a propagation of noise through the ocean. It's harder to hear the farther than that. And there's also the, uh, the balance here that you don't really need to tell people exactly where the whale is. You just, they just need to know that in this zone there are whales. So since the last call, they might have moved around a bunch, so we just want to alert the whole zone as being a uh, high chance of whales. So the green buoys are working and have not heard whales in the last 24 hours. The red ones in this display are have heard a whale within the last 24 hours, and the gray ones are currently not functioning. Keeping buoys working out in the ocean is not easy. And these buoys are actually in and among ship traffic and uh, it's definitely a good challenge to keep these guys going. Now one thing to note here is you'll see red on this display. When ships are going through the TSS, the traffic separation scheme, they're not supposed to leave that unless they have a collision issue directly. So they're supposed to stay in that when they see an alert. So in other pictures you'll see this be as yellow as a warning as opposed to red here. This is just for people on shore to know that there's an alert. With a mariner, we don't want to give them that immediate cue of like, get out of here, go north or go south around this, when they might be getting into areas of even more whales. So you'll see a yellow caution flag in uh, the interfaces designed for mariners. So back in 2005, before this even started, uh, Professor Lee Alexander at UNH proposed to NOAA that we actually have an alert system put in place that would transmit a, these MIOs or marine information overlays to the ship that says where the whales were. So here you can see a red box saying on uh, the 12th of July 2005 that there was a bunch of whales sighted in this particular patch. Now this didn't really get going. There wasn't enough momentum to get going but Lee had the right idea in in this. And with the, the buoys coming in the, the initial strategy was to telephone the ship every time a whale call came in. 
Now, if there's 50 whale calls in a day as a ship comes in, that means you're going to get 50 phone calls to the bridge. That's got to be horribly annoying. And so Lee's idea came back to life and combined with my work on AIS, the Automatic Identification System, and we came up with a strategy to broadcast messages out to the ships such that it would be received on their general AIS, end up on the data computers, the, the data inside the computers on the bridge, and be automatically displayable as uh, without having to do anything by the mariner. And what that would then give us is a way that hands-free the mariner can just turn on a layer and say, please do tell me where the whales are. And instead of doing 50 phone calls, they just look at the screen whenever they're going to look at it normally, and they'll get a sense of what's going on. So you'll see in the top left, I've taken a screenshot from ICANN's Aldebaran 2, and I photoshopped in a Google Earth image that I prototyped. And we started off with that as our initial concept. And we have sort of a schematic here of a whale talking, going to a buoy, that message being sent to an Iridium satellite, going to Cornell, and then going back out to the ships. So it's actually fun. In the beginning, I actually used Google Earth as my prototyping tool because I could actually create something that looked like a nicely mocked up interface that would be somewhat functional. And you can see here are 10 TSS buoys that are working and not hearing ships. And they're green, so no, no whale detected. As time goes on, they'll hear a whale call, so they'll turn yellow. Hear another whale call, turn yellow again. And as time goes on, once they get to 24 hours, those uh, buoys will go back to green on the display. Works pretty well. Uh, unfortunately here we're dropping into some pretty hefty technical stuff. I proposed an initial AIS message that I designed that was fairly simple. We then had to work with the RTCM Working Group SC121 and this is the AIS for VTS Working Group in the United States trying to come up with a way that we could create a message that was uh, some sort of standard that people would all know to use the same exact message. After working with this group for a long time, unfortunately we end up with a message that's way complicated. There's a lot going on in it. It does handle a lot of different cases. In fact, it can handle more than a hundred different types of events, not just whales out there. Uh, things like debris in the water, distress areas for ships, oil spilled in particular areas, uh, shoals that have just been discovered before they get put on a chart. So this message is pretty widely uh, adoptable, so hopefully it will see use in all kinds of cases once people get over the initial complexity of the design. So here's some of the possible options. Um, you can look in the actual international standard and see the many different possibles. Uh, there could be an area for active dredging, areas for short-term fishing restrictions, and all that kind of information would just show up on a mariner's display. And these, uh, this message is designed to handle all sorts of different shapes. Uh, so it can do circles, points, um, squares, all kinds of stuff. And then that lets uh, the people who are controlling the waterways be able to specify a variety of different uh, shapes. So here's a little prototype I created in Google Earth of the actual final IMO standard from my software. I created an open source library that would actually implement all this message that people could use to compare with their own code as they write stuff for their, their software. Because I wrote mine in Python, someone else might write theirs in C or some other language or Java or something like that. And I wanted to be able to make sure that everybody was able to test against something and make sure the interoperability was there. And this also shows that it became an international maritime organization standard in I believe 2010. It's uh, called Circular 289, and there's also a Circular 290 that talks about how you might display this message. So I encourage you to take a look at those standards. So let's talk a little bit about how it's implemented out here. We have a transmitter, uh, or a transceiver, it's actually listening most of the time, and then it broadcasts occasionally, out at Provincetown in the Visitor Center, down located in the bottom right there of the figure, and it covers the area fairly well within the, the Boston approaches. Here's a view in the basement of the visitor center, often known as the zombie room. On the right is the listening station with a SR-161 receiver from Shine Micro. And on the left, I'm actually swapping from an initial Class A device to a second Class A device that actually has the Blue Force software on it, so it could actually go silent and not keep broadcasting like it's a ship sitting on top of Cape Cod. 
and we've gone through another edition after that. The device we actually wanted to have in the end, we started off with a base station as our prototype, which is expensive and big, and we ended up with this L3 Aton device, which actually is uh, designed to be eight, an eight navigation out there, and so it has a little bit different software design to handle the case of being a station that's just broadcasting information. So this is on my desk with a receiver on the left, just a really cheap one, and then a control computer on the right and a laptop to watch what's going on. Now one thing we did while we were out there is we actually took a look at where we could or couldn't receive the message from a test vessel. This is just from the RV AUK. It's a small NOAA vessel, so it's not got the antenna quite up there. But what this shows is that we were actually able to receive the message in the zones where we were actually going to have the ships. Uh, it's not received as often as I would like, but it's still pretty good. And what that let, lets us know is that the message is actually getting out to where the ships would be, and I used really cheap stuff. So the, the receivers on a ship are going to be much better quality, and they should get great coverage out there. Uh, it also implies we might in the future want to add more transmitters in the area to make sure that coverage is great. Okay, and when we were looking at what kind of software to put on the ship, that we thought of a number of strategies initially. The first one was a portable pilot unit, or PPU, and that's something you throw in a bag and take on the ship, and when you're done, you take it off the ship. Typically a laptop or something like that that's really mobile, and you bring everything with you. The other option was to integrate that into the existing bridge computers. So those are typically like a Transis, 7Cs, L3, or Konigsberg software. There's a number of other vendors. These are heavily regulated systems, and so it's hard for the vendors to actually make changes because everything has to get approved, and they have to be very careful because this is if this breaks, the ship is not going to be moving anywhere. So we looked at portable pilot units, and this is an area where mariners have actually had a lot of innovation. This is a secondary system on the bridge, so it's not the critical navigator. And so they can go ahead and put extra functionality in this without fear of getting in the way of the captain piloting the ship. There's a person whose job is to be a pilot or basically control the ship in a small waterways and they need extra information of a certain type. And the portable pilot unit has been a place where they've been able to innovate with this. So we thought that might be a great solution. And the integrated bridges, I think in the long term, are the right place for this to be in addition to, to everywhere else. But it does take a lot of time and um, it is a part of uh, the software that's normally on the ship and is critical, so it will take a while to be adopted. But in the long run, this software is already used by the bridge crew, and it has no extra clutter of an extra computer or a mobile phone type device, um, and they already are trained on it, so there won't be a whole lot of extra to work to do that. To work with this, we tried to take two approaches. Uh, we picked the the external device, not the bridge computer, to give it a go for the first time. This is the Volpe Lab in Boston. It's their software called TV32 or Transview32. They implemented a decoder of the message, so you can see it here in the Boston Approaches being received from an antenna out there and actually being transmitted. So that they've used this red again, which wasn't quite what we wanted with the, the Mariners. And ICANN stepped up and offered to do the first prototype for us and graciously spent a lot of time making their software be able to understand these messages and work out some of the kinks with how it might go. And so you can see here their initial display of right wing messages in their Regulus 2 or Aldebaran software. And once we had that working, we took it out to the LNG companies who are paying for this as their environmental offset and ran them through the software, came up with a whole bunch of things that were good and bad with it, and try to iterate to make it much better for them and to actually work with folks who have to deal with it every day as opposed to me and my lab making arbitrary decisions about the ocean. And we got it up on their big screen and had them chat over how to use it, had them try it out, and it was, it was pretty good. Then we took it out to the ship, and so here's us getting onto a natural gas ship via crane. These things are pretty huge. And so we took this software and place it up on the bridge on a laptop. So here's just a little uh, laptop running Windows and it's displaying the whale notices. And so it gives you a sense of what you'll be looking at and what's out the window. And 
Those are big windows, and the ocean is far away. It's a good distance to the front of the ship. It's still even a pretty decent distance just to the side of the ship to get to the, any, any water. And here's a closer view of what it looks like on the bridge with a laptop being the support for visualization of the whale notices. Just behind the guy in white on the very far right is the port where actually you hook up a Wi-Fi adapter to what's called the pilot port where AIS data comes out of the ship. Now that worked fairly well, but we thought it's kind of frustrating. There's a, a laptop that's got to be there. People aren't too excited about having you know, laptops around the bridge. They're kind of hard to walk around with, especially if the ship's moving. And I've been working with the folks at NASA Ames who've been providing Android phones to people who are firefighters in aircraft. And these people are circling around fires, working in an environment where they can't really take their eyes off of flying, and they've been able to use these phones to take quick pictures out the window and update the folks at the command center automatically. And the whole thought of having an iPhone or an Android phone take a picture out the window, automatically update it, really triggered something in me in terms of suddenly these mobile phones in our pockets are a lot more powerful than we thought. And they're already pretty amazing at what they can do, but they can be a whole part of a sensor network that we never even imagined. And so after doing some training with the folks in the firefighting office and talking about how we might send stuff on, you know, use it to control underwater vehicles, track ships, think about tablets, the technology really jumped out. And Chris Trembley, after spending time with me on the ship, the LNG ship for a day, said, why in the world aren't we doing this on an iPad? This is nuts. These laptops are clunky. Let's give the iPad a go, can't we? So I went home and made a mock-up in Google Earth. So here we are on an iPad with a little Google Earth model, a KML that I loaded up. And you can see that it looks pretty reasonable and it fits in your hand. You could have a little bag. You could actually put, if, if it was on an iPhone, it could just go in your pocket. Uh, pretty convenient and really cheap. I mean, you already have your phone. A couple hundred dollars will buy you an uh, um, iPhone, and four or five hundred dollars will get you an iPad. So here we have a solution that might really work. Now I sat down and tried to code up my first whale application, which you see on the left. It actually still says Open Earthquake in External Application. You can tell that I used an earthquake uh, observation tool to be my initial starting point. And it was just a list and that wasn't too great. You really want to see in a map. So I partnered up with EarthNC and Virgil and Brad uh, decided to give it a go and work with us to volunteer their time to build an app to display the whales on their mapping software on the iPhone. And on the right you can see the very first version where I got a screenshot of this working in the iPhone simulator on the desktop displaying some whale notices and that was pretty exciting. And here's the first version that looks pretty reasonable that I ever had for the iPad on my desktop with the iOS simulator from Apple in Xcode. And you can see it's a little Earth NC marine chart app that we've then modified to decode the whale notices with my libAIS software that I wrote for the Deepwater Horizon incident. I added into that the ability to decode the whale message in addition to all the ship positions. So at this point, we were ready to go for the Whale Alert app, and here's the splash screen. Um, I thought put together this really nice illustration of whales and the buoys and the marine sanctuary up on the top, and gives you a sense of what's going on. Unfortunately, it was getting a little crazy with icons, so not everybody that I would like to have had on there has their icon, but all of these people and many who are not named here have worked really hard to create this wonderful app. So I got to show off the app here, take a look at it, and compare it to actual whale data on the long-standing web application that's been written by Cornell that's been running for four or five years. And you see in the background some whale notices. There's three whales that are marked red on the web page, and there are three buoys marked on the iPad as yellow. So I was very excited to see this happen. This was in last fall. and just last week, in April 2012, the whole group was able to release the Whale Alert iPad app out to the public. So here's an overview of it, uh, zoomed way out. There's 
a component that's the AIS notices for whales, which you can get both over your 3G and internet connection and AIS, so you can do any one of those three ways. Or it's also got some messages that are not AIS based called the dynamic management areas where they notice that there's a whole bunch of whales either by some ship seeing them or an aircraft, something like that. And those will come in here too. So we'll zoom into the actual area and you can see that when buoys are not functional, they don't show up. So there's no information. And in those areas um, where we do have working buoys, the yellow ones are whales. If you're outside of the speed regulated areas, which have just as a new thing in the area where you must go 10 knots or less no matter what during certain parts of the year. If you're outside of that, you'll get circles around the yellow. If you're inside, you'll just get a yellow buoy. And if the buoy is working inside of the area but has not detected whales, instead of being green, it will actually be gray. So here you can see a buoy on the left that's actually green in that it's working and has not detected a whale in the last 24 hours. And that would be buoy number one on the left. Buoy number two is yellow with a circle around it. Buoy number three is gray. And right at the corner of the TSS where it changes direction, there's one buoy, number seven, that is yellow marking a whale detected and it tells you the time that it expires unfortunately I took the screenshot in California so it says PDT time so at 1253 that buoy is going to expire and it'll go away and if we take a look at the next one in fact at that time 1254 the buoy is gone we haven't heard from it again so we actually have to mark it as empty so there can't be a, a gray buoy showing that things are okay so as a mariner, that's a caution sign to you. There's a non-working buoy. So that's up to you to figure out how to adapt your thinking about where whales might be. Um, one thing to think about with this app is the mariner's responsibility is to always look out the window and know what's going on. So even if the whole system stopped working, they're still responsible for avoiding whales. So this is just a way to help inform them and keep them aware of what's going on in the situation in the area. If they see every buoy lit up, they're going to know that there's whales everywhere and they need to really, really be careful. Okay. And let's show you the picture of the first time we ever got this working on a ship. So this is on the NOAA ship AUK sitting in the dock in Situate. And we actually received AIS through the antenna on the roof. And you can see text scrolling across the screen. That's AIS messages coming in over the radio. And the iPad in the back is so far received two working buoys that haven't heard anything. That was pretty exciting. Um, this is kind of far away from the typical area and the ship is a lot lower than the large LNG ships. So in this mode, right now that 3G and internet's working, I would have just turned the, the iPad into 3G mode and then I would have just received the messages over the internet that way. So inside of the app, there's some helpers to help explain some of the right rules and regulations that are going on in this area. They're fairly complicated and they've been worked on very hard by all the marine management folks in the area so please do read up on them they are a little confusing if you haven't uh, spent time with them but they've been thought out very carefully and argued over for years people will try really hard to make these the best possible rules for all involved both the whales and the humans inside the app we have some controls that you might like to see uh, you can see here that we actually have a server that's serving up the messages over the internet and you can actually grab those and use them for anything else that you feel like it. They're for non-commercial use. Go for it. And that mirrors what the Cornell website has got in terms of basic status for the whales. Then they're basically a little AIS message coming through and you can set the port for your ship and change it all around depending on any Wi-Fi settings you might have on your ship. Inside the app there's a logging mode so you can test your connection. So here these exclamation point AIVDM messages are what's called NEMA strings that from the AIS and they're actually ship position messages and whale calls and things like that being detected so all of these messages describe various things that are going on with the ships and the buoys. Now this app has been released into the Apple App Store on I think it was April 3rd 2012 and it's the icon third from the left on the top with the whale tail that's red. Whale or ship. And uh, I think everybody who's downloaded it, uh, last time I checked it was 19th in the navigation apps. That's pretty exciting for me to have something that we've worked on get to be so popular so fast. And uh, 
totally free. Please download and try it, even if you're not a Mariner, and if even if you're not in the area around Boston. The idea is this app can actually work elsewhere if the infrastructure comes in place without any changes. So if you work with your local country, even non-US folks, you can turn this app into a working setup by just being able to broadcast AIS with these messages in your home country's waters. Do, however, talk to your local marine managers because they have different rules in each country for how to do this stuff. So here's the app. I've got it installed on my iPad. So you can see that it says installed on the left, but it is most definitely free and supported by the folks at EarthNC who've done an amazing job. And there is a website on the Stellwagen Bank for Whale Alert. So just Google Stellwagen Bank and Whale Alert. You'll get this page. It tells you all about the app. And please try it out. Give us feedback, positive and negative, and uh, do whatever you can to help support protecting our environment. Thank you very much. Now, um, one thing to think about in the future is how to extend this. So I am totally excited when people do other stuff with this data. So here's the Niracus, uh folks, the ocean observing folks of New England. They've worked with Cornell to put the whale buoys on their website. So here's a Google Maps display with it. And I think that's totally exciting. So try to integrate this with your own software. If you've if your company builds uh, an either you know mobile or bridge computer of some sort and it can't decode the whale message, please, please, please add the whale message and any other messages that are in the IMO Circular 289. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions on that topic. Now I wanted to call out three people in particular on this project. Dave Wiley on the left in the brown sweater. Michael Thompson in the Gumby suit who's doing training for our newest cruise member on this cruise, and Leela Hatch, who's not shown. These three at the NOAA Stellwagen Bank have really kept me going through this project and have been a huge motivating factor. They're totally awesome, and I couldn't have done it without their support. Now, at the end of this talk, I'd like to show quickly what it looks like to have these buoys in Google Earth. So here I've got the Boston Whale Zones here. I'll hide the places. Okay. So we've got a bunch of buoys, and for each one we've got some overly technical stuff. So it's not too hard to take this data and turn it to some other interface and keep track of this stuff. Um, so I encourage you to try whatever system you've got to you know, add these kinds of zones into it, mix it up with whatever data, whatever data you have, and see how it works. Thank you very much.